Welcome to Fertility and Sterility On Air, the podcast where you can stay current on the latest global research in the field of reproductive medicine. This podcast brings you an overview of this month's journal, in-depth discussion with authors, and other special features. FNS On Air is brought to you by the Fertility and Sterility Family of Journals in conjunction with the American Society for Reproductive Medicine. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of FNS Unplugged. I'm your host, Pietro Bordelato, and as always, I'm joined by Dalen and Blake. Dalen, Blake, how are you two? Doing well, doing well. Great to see you guys, as always. Cannot complain. Dalen, you look a little bit more tan than usual. Did you come back from vacation recently? I was up in the slopes, you know, not a lot of fertility up there. Too, too tired, quite honestly, at the end of the day to get into it. Yeah, that's the same way I felt at the beach on my March vacation. It was lovely, but I'm happy to be back. We have good science to talk about. We're going to talk about kind of a non-traditional topic first. FNS Reports is kind of the ground zero for cool articles, is how I like to consider within the family of journals. We get the unique case reports. We get the stuff that doesn't fit classically into the journal. And this is a cool one. How many of you guys are familiar with post-mortem sperm retrieval? Right? That's kind of an wow. interesting concept. Have you ever been involved in a postmortem sperm retrieval? No, I have not, and I don't plan to, but the only experience I have was a CREOG question as a resident, and to this day, I still don't know the answer to that question, but you're going to tell us, I have a feeling. Well, I'm going to try. Did you know that the first postmortem sperm retrieval was described in the 80s? So people have been actually doing this for about four decades now, and we do it in events of unexpected death or when a patient has expressed a desire to have children after death. And we've been doing it long enough that the Ethics Committee at the SRB actually has put together a committee opinion to talk about this specifically. And they say that we may consider this technique ethically justifiable under certain circumstances, including written consent from the deceased or a request by the surviving spouse or partner. It's pretty controversial. Some people have very strong feelings about retrieving gametes from men and women after they've died, unless they've specifically said that they want this done. But there's kind of several limitations to actually be able to do this. You can't do this on everyone. Several factors here. One is the time between death and the collection, underlying comorbidities or subfertility in the person you're collecting sperm from, and then storage conditions of the sperm. So the first point about time between death and collection, the medical literature has a couple of case reports, and typically they talk about extracting viable sperm between 24 to 36 hours after death, which if you think about it, you find out someone dies, you got to get a whole lot of stuff rolling from a consult perspective, ethics, IRB, getting the actual people to do the sperm retrieval. That's a really short window of time to be able to do this. Well, this is a really unique case report that maybe challenges that conception that we only have 24 to 36 hours to do it. We maybe we have a couple days, question mark. So this is a cool case report from the University of Miami, great andrology group down there, of a 44-year-old man who has a history of recreational marijuana use, occasional alcohol consumption, and he was brought into the local ED in cardiac arrest. He had been reporting lightheadedness, nausea, vomiting about 30 minutes before, and then just kind of just felt unwell. He had no real medical history that we knew of, no history of subfertility, um, had been using condoms inconsistently, but hadn't gotten anyone pregnant recently. He showed up to the ED. He had to get defibrillated, intubated, kind of got the full court press in terms of coding, but was unfortunately pronounced dead uh, about 35 minutes after the onset of his cardiac arrest. Now, there apparently was a program in place where the, this group of researchers would be notified from the medical examiner's office that there were patients were male between 15 and 60 who were experienced sudden death without comorbidities, without prior hospitalization. And these were men that they had an opportunity to contact their next of kin to see if they could consent them for post-mortem sperm retrieval. So they got in contact with this person's wife and were able to get consent from her. And what they did is they went and removed the patient's testicle and biopsied the testicle at 13 hours post-mortem collected four samples, placed them into a vial containing sperm wash, and then put the testicle on ice and refrigerated it, and left it ex vivo out of the body. Now, the testicle biopsy was conducted every 24 hours following the first biopsy to determine if there were viable spermatozoa, and then the biopsies were analyzed until no spermatozoa were visible. Now, you're wondering, what's the viability of sperm at that 13-hour mark? Well, about 60% of the sperm that they saw in that first biopsy result were viable at 13 hours. 
Once you got out to the next day, 34 hours, that number dropped to 57%. By 58 hours, it was 47%. 82 hours, 34%. And you guessed it, 106 hours, you were still finding viable sperm, which is just an incredible number and really why this is a unique case report in that and maybe you have more than 24 to 36 hours to find sperm if this is something that's meaningfully important for this couple uh, to be able to reproduce post-mortem. Blake, Dalon, let me ask you, at face value, retrieving sperm at someone who's been deceased for 106 hours, yeah, you can do it. That's kind of cool, and you find viable sperm, but reproductive potential, DNA fragmentation of the sperm, it, well, these are kind of big unanswered questions. What do you think, Blake and, and Dalon? Yeah, I mean, a lot of things going through my mind with regard to this. Uh, very interesting that this can be done. But yeah, I mean, you you bring up a very good point when the body is not doing anything for several hours or days at least. And we're concerned about, is there a slight fluctuation in temperature change with a varicocele that might lead to DNA fragmentation? I can't even help but think that this sperm is just not going to be good quality. But uh, I don't know. I mean, prospectively looking at how uh, the sperm fertilizes and embryo development, that would be very interesting to me. Or maybe we could just do a stat DNA fragmentation test on this sperm as well. I, I don't know. That is very interesting, but I can't help but think that the sperm is probably not going to be very good at that point. Have not had any blood supply to the testicles for a few days. I don't know. Just my thought. Well, it's a temperature change in the different direction, right? We worry about the varicocele raising temperature. They did say they were keeping it at 45 degrees. So I think they're regulating, but I, like Blake, agree that the competency of this sperm is in question. And also, I think in terms of like clinical practicality, it should be noted, as you did, uh, but emphasize that the testicle was taken out 13 hours and then it was out of the body. So we're not talking about really uh, extraction of, uh, of sperm from a corpse. We're talking about extraction of, of, of sperm from a testicle, which I, I don't know if that's clinical. And that gets to my real question here for you guys in terms of clinical practice. Like, what is the threshold for you guys personally uh, of consent? So what's the threshold? Are you comfortable with that next of kin level of consent? I've been involved in one case of a perimortem sperm extraction consent. And in that case, ultimately, they decided not to do it. I asked the, the folks that I was doing the counseling with in your experience over the, the last couple of decades, how often does this happen? It's a one in every blue moon kind of consult. And invariably, they ultimately decide not to do it because there's some hurdles here. There's like the legal hurdle. There's the ethical hurdle. There's the moral hurdle of, do you want to actually reproduce with this sperm after the fact? So I think these are really rare things. These are not things that I think REIs are dealing with on a routine basis at all. But interestingly, if you look at the literature, there's actually more than one way to extract sperm post-mortem. Electro ejaculation, there's um, testicular sperm aspiration, testicular biopsy. In this case, they did an epididymomyomectomy where they actually just removed a chunk of the epididymis and the testicular tissue. So they had a lot of tissue to work with. You know, the literature is littered with case reports, and I think this is a nice benchmark. You can extract sperm this far out, and it's at least viable. So we'll see what the literature looks like next. There are people trying to do this uh, at further and further time points from. Um, passing away, and are they actually looking at the reproductive potential of these sperm that they're retrieving? I think that would be the next big question I have. Can we do it? Yes. Does it work? Question mark. Yeah, and that's the big question, right? If Are these sperm going to work? Are they going to fertilize? And good segue to my story, though. It's also about sperm. You guys, of course, uh, know the numbers, and we've all heard them. Roughly 15% of couples dealing with infertility, roughly half of those present with male factors and things aren't looking up. Multiple studies and a lot of media coverage lately has pointed toward a pretty startling decline in sperm parameters in post-industrialized nations. The question is why? The degree of decline over a relatively short period, I think, points toward environmental or lifestyle influences. And there's a consensus that increased oxidative stress and resultant production of reactive oxidative species um, that damage spermatocyte DNA is a likely culprit. But stress, quote unquote stress, is a bit of a catch-all. There's inflammatory stress, like in the context of varicocele that you're alluding to there, Blake, infection, inflammation, higher testicular temperature, even as uh, Pietro, you were alluding to, all of which result in reduced sperm quality. 
There are also environmental exposures, right? Air pollution, phthalates, food additives, and or individual health parameters like obesity, lifestyle choices, smoking, alcohol, drug abuse, that can increase oxidative stress and affect fertility. But this story is about something we can all relate to, and that's sleep, specifically chronic sleep deprivation. We all understand the value of a good night's rest to our mental function, but sleep is also critical to homeostasis of many of our biological systems, including fertility. Sleep deprivation in rodents reduces testosterone and impairs sexual behavior, and has also been linked to anatomical and functional aberrations in the prostate, as well as reduced sperm quality, motility, and viability. But I can see my co-host rolling their eyes as I expound on the rodent prostate. And I must agree that modeling anything related to fertility, much less behavioral modification like sleep deprivation, is pretty tough and needs to be carefully considered. For example, many of the sleep dep deprivation studies in rodents employed 24 or 48 even hours of total sleep deprivation, which is not nice for the mice. And also, I don't think representative of the chronic sleep deprivation we're talking about in our patient population for whom sleep deprivation is presumably less extreme, but extended or chronic. So to provide a model that more closely approximates the chronic nature of sleep deprivation in humans, the first author, Luana Adami, and senior author, Ricardo Bertoya, from the Universidad Federal de Sao Paulo in Brazil used a modified model of sleep deprivation that was achieved by gentle handling. And that's in quotes. The gentle handling involved keeping the mice awake during the first six hours of the sleep cycle by stimulating them as soon as they exhibited typical sleep behaviors, closed eyes, curled body, motor quiescence, like poking them as they were falling asleep, which I mean, I don't know if you could call that gentle handling, more annoying or infuriating. But they did this for five consecutive days with the comparison sleep recovery group that was then allowed to sleep normally for a sixth day. And from those two groups and related controls, they collected spermatozoa and analyzed sperm motility, intracellular superoxide activity, acrosome integrity, mitochondrial activity, and DNA fragmentation. What they found was that both sleep deprivation and the sleep recovery groups had fewer spermatozoa with intact acrosomes. Also, unexpectedly, the sperm concentration was increased in the sleep recovery group relative to control. So th the results were not exactly straightforward, and, and I would encourage our listeners to have a closer look. But uh, the bottom line seems to me, this model of sleep deprivation results in sperm anomalies that are not rescued by sleep recovery over 24 hours. So that was one of the major conclusions of the authors is that the sleep deprivation, it's not good. And uh, having 24 hours of recovery is not enough to, to rescue it. But the greater impact of the paper for me is the use of this gentle handling model. I mean, as ridiculous as that sound, I think th that it's appropriate and a lot more studies need to be done perhaps using this alternative method of sleep deprivation, because most studies using our studying sleep deprivation and fertility in rodents have used what's called paradoxical sleep deprivation, which restricts REM sleep, but allows non-REM sleep. Total sleep deprivation applied in a manner that models the chronic nature of reduced sleep quality that I think we as humans experience may have a better chance of elucidating mechanisms that underlie poor sperm quality. But I mean, look, there's a lot of things regarding stress and oxidative stress that are affecting fertility. I think this is a drop in the bucket compared to a lot of maybe anatomical or, or other physiological, pathophysiological mechanisms, but no less important, I think, because it's something that we all struggle with uh, and an important insight into mechanisms, perhaps, of the negative influence on fertility. What do you guys think? So to clarify, you guys got a grad student to keep mice awake for six hours? No, not and my study, but I guarantee you, in, in every lab, there's someone available for gentle handling. I can, I can assure you that. I've got my own gentle handler in my lab, of course. So they, they watch for their little eyes to close and then they poke them? That, is that what they do? Yes. I don't know how it got through the eye cook, but uh, apparently that's not so cruel as it sounds. Well... I would not want that job, but, you know, I feel like it, there is a common recurring theme here of DNA fragmentation, and we've talked about it in several of our episodes, and we keep coming back to it. So this is interesting, and I have patients all the time who ask me, is there something that I can do that, before they start IVF? What can I do to help improve things? And so, you know, this is something we certainly can mention to them. Of course, 
this is in mice data, but a, a mouse is analogous to a human in your eyes day long. But, you know, this is something that, well, make sure you get good sleep. And there's studies that this may improve sperm quality and decrease uh, the DNA fragmentation. So there's certainly something good to come from that. And this sleep concept, I think we've been talking a little bit longer about in, in our female patients that we know that disruptions to circadian rhythm, night shift workers are at risk for a host of other bad IVF and perinatal outcomes. There's definitely something to like a nice, strong circadian rhythm that's not disrupted and and flows normally. So I, I think this is cool. I like um, the sleep deprivation research. I'm less excited about it in murine sperm and would love to see some stuff in humans, but cool conversation starting. It's good science. I'm glad it's out there and big shout out to the folks from Brazil. Absolutely. Sao Paulo represent, but I think most importantly, it's a key, I mean, call it a brick in the wall, but I don't think that's the right analogy. I think that it's a matter of connecting the dots. I mean, like you said, there's a lot of studies in female, also males. I mean, it's generally understood. There's consensus that sleep deprivation, especially chronic sleep deprivation, results in shortened lifespan. I mean, we're talking across all systems here. So the idea that it would affect male fertility as well as, as female, I think, isn't very far-fetched. I think the challenge here is how do we connect those dots? How do we identify what specifically it is about the sleep de sleep deprivation mechanistically that's affecting the, the sperm and you know whether or not we can identify targets to rescue that. And that's why I'm much more invested here in the system and, and the approach. Perfect model for sleep deprivation that's a correlate to human doesn't exist in mice, of course, but it's an experimental system that's accessible and may start us along that path. But as I said, I think the idea and the approach of tackling this in men and sperm, I think is important. And I, I nod here to the group in Sao Paulo. Well, speaking of another brick in the wall, Blake, why don't you give us some education on how adenomyosis impacts endometrial receptivity? Oh, thank you for that nice little segue there. So my paper today is completely and entirely different from the prior studies. So the title of my article I'll be reviewing is How Does Adenomyosis Impact Endometrial Receptivity? An Updated Systematic Review of Clinical and Molecular Insights. The first author, Takehiro Harioka of the University of Tokyo. Adenomyosis is characterized by the presence of ectopic endometrium-like epithelial glands and stroma within the myometrium. We all probably have a handful of patients who have had this in the past, and it is quite a debilitating disease in which they have very, very painful periods, oftentimes heavy as well, and this is quite difficult to treat for not only pain management, heavy bleeding, but also infertility. Morbidity of adenomyosis ranges anywhere from about 8 to 24% in women undergoing assisted reproductive technology, which is certainly something that is not negligible in its prevalence. Alterations in the junctional zone, so which is close to where the embryo implantation takes place, uh, may be a causal relationship, and this uh, the relationship could exist between adenomyosis and infertility. The authors discuss several mechanisms that exist, which would include local inflammation, abnormal uterotubal sperm transport, and impaired endometrial receptivity, which have been shown to decrease implantation rates and clinical pregnancy rates based on prior studies. However, the symptoms of adenomyosis are quite heterogeneous, the extent of the lesions may vary, and the diagnostic criteria are somewhat inconsistent, and so therefore it's been quite challenging to quantify the effect of adenomyosis on infertility. So that's essentially what the author sought to do. So they wanted to review the effects of adenomyosis on endometrial receptivity as it pertains to infertility. They did a literature review and ultimately included 123 articles based on the relevance to the topic at hand. And so when going over the findings, I'm just going to kind of categorize the different topics as they pertain to adenomyosis with infertility. So they first looked at clinical pregnancy rates. So the data is mixed with regards to this, and they discussed that contrary to long Lupron protocols in which we have a suppressive or down-regulatory effect, the GnRH agonist flare or the antagonist protocols do not necessarily obtain the beneficial effect of downregulation of estrogen. Because of this, there's a failure to reduce uterine volume in patients with adenomyosis, and the authors suspect that this may not ameliorate the defects in endometrial function, which we'll get into in just a moment. There's additional evidence that strengthens this hypothesis from prior studies that show 
an association, however, not statistically significant, but an association with GnRH agonist before frozen embryo transfer cycles, and this may increase pregnancy rates by decreasing the estrogen environment before embryo transfer. Now, I know if Micah Hill were listening to this, he'd want me to make sure that I clarify that when studies say words like there's an association or a trend or it shows a slight difference, but are not statistically significant, then we pretty much shouldn't even be including that at all. So there's no association if it's not a statistical significance. So we're not trying to inflate the findings here when in fact there's not a statistical significance. So I wanted to make sure and mention that because Mike, I'm sure you're probably going to hunt me down if I didn't say that. However, there was one small study that the authors had mentioned that utilize 11 agestrol IUD prior to frozen embryo transfer, and this did have a statistically significant improvement in live birth rates before embryo transfer, or if utilizing this approach before embryo transfer. And so all of this taken together, the author suggests that pretreatment with a GnRH agonist or 11 agestrol IUD may be beneficial prior to frozen embryo transfer in women with adenomyosis. So then the authors discuss severity of adenomyosis. Now, there have been a lot of recent advancements in imaging, such as MRI, transvaginal ultrasound, and have enabled a non-invasive assessment of the severity of adenomyosis. Now, historically, adenomyosis has been diagnosed via pathology, has been the gold standard. But as, again, as imaging advances and becomes better and better over time, there are several things that we can put together collectively and are highly suggestive of the presence of adenomyosis. And so there is a morphological uterus sonographic assessment consensus. And in the presence of multiple characteristics within that, they uh, lead to the diagnosis of adenomyosis. And so the more risk factors you have, such as asymmetrical myometrial thickening, myometrial cyst, hyperechoic islands, fan-shaped shadowing, irregular junctional zone, just to name a few, the presence of more and more of those characteristics therefore alludes to a higher severity of adenomyosis. And therefore, the more severe these authors show that there is an association with decreased clinical pregnancy rates. And then the last big chunk of this paper, they talk about impaired decisualization of the endometrial stromal cells. Now, normally the window of implantation comes about, uh, progesterone leads to the cessation of epithelial proliferation. And then the proliferation slash decidualization of the stroma is antagonized, or the effects of 17 beta estradiol is antagonized, that effect on the endometrium. And so at that point, progesterone takes over and has an effect on the endometrium. The window of implantation is apparently altered by aberrant cellular signaling of patients with adenomyosis. They look at and describe several different molecular signals, such as HOX10 expression, which is very important for endometrial receptivity. And in adenomyosis, there's a defective des decidualization with HOX10 altered expression. And they also dis discuss insufficient expression of adhesion molecules during the window of implantation, such as integrin, beta-3, osteopontin, and selectins. And there's also an increased amount of pro-inflammatory cytokines, such as interleukins. And then lastly, they discuss about there is a molecule that is also important for progesterone receptivity called KRAS, and there were studies that showed that there was alterations in this progesterone receptor from defective KRAS signaling. So then the next have a very nice table. We always talk about how we love tables on here and add it to Daylon's clinical repertoire so he can be a clinician one day with us. But there is a very nice summarization of a lot of the different molecules that they discuss on table one. And then they have a really nice drawing on figure two that shows a very nice, well put together figure. So I encourage our readers to go back and look at that. And so in conclusion, the authors discuss how uterine adenomyosis reduces endometrial receptivity via several mechanisms, as I just summarized. In addition, data suggests that the etiologic mechanism of adenomyosis is responsible for impaired endometrial receptivity. And then they discuss that treatment with a gonadotropin-releasing hormone agonist before frozen thawed embryo transfer may ameliorate the defective uterine environment and restore receptivity. So that's kind of ultimately their take-home message is that in patients with adenomyosis, rather than undergoing surgical intervention, which some of these patients can, although Pietro, I'll let you chime in on that. I know you do a lot of surgery, but adenomyosis and surgery is not a fun mixture. And I know that there are people out there that are special in this and a lot better at these surgeries than I probably am, but 
these patients that I've taken to the OR to try and remove an adenomyoma is, it is not fun. So I'm interested to hear your all's thoughts on this. I've said it for a long time. I think the uterus and uterine factor infertility is our last big frontier. We know so little about the uterus as a synthetic organ, as a structural organ, as a um, window into issues with implantation and an end organ for some issues that are happening in the ovary and in the pelvis. Adenomyosis is super tricky. One of the things that I was turned on to at ASRM at this last, or AGL at the last meeting, there's a group in the Netherlands that's working on machine learning and exposing an AI software to thousands and thousands of MRI and ultrasound images of women who eventually go on to maybe have a formal diagnosis of adenomyosis or even hysterectomy to prove adenomyosis. And what they're noticing is that there's kind of signs very early on before it even kind of reaches that threshold of like, this is clinically looks like adenomyosis. We can make the diagnosis of adenomyosis on imaging that are, you can see years before. And what they're suggesting is that these free adenomyotic appearing lesions appearance to the uterus is probably to blame for a lot of the failures that we're seeing in some of our IVF treatments. Transfer of euploid embryos, why, why don't those work? Those should work pretty well. Maybe there's some adenomyosis there that's just not kind of crossing the threshold of clinically meaningful, but there's maybe some advanced imaging tools to be able to kind of highlight that. Problem is once you highlight it, what do you do with it? And I think Blake, you summarized nicely that there's some stuff that we've all kind of tried. You can use suppressive therapies, letrozole, if you have a big OMA where you can actually go in and excise it, there's definitely some data to support that being a thing. But we don't really have great interventions. And I've also done adenomyosis surgery, Blake. I've, the OSADA procedure is probably the one that most of us are familiar with where you remove an adenomyoma and then do the triple flap technique to put the uterus back together, add some structural integrity to it. These are hard procedures. They bleed like stink. You always yeah. don't sleep well for about a week afterwards because you're making sure- A lot that of blood things, loss. Yeah, you're making sure that these things come back together and preserving some structural integrity to this uterus. I have more questions than answers with adenomyosis. If, if, if Jalen, if you have anything clinical to share with us, please, because we're, we're grasping at straws here. We don't have a whole lot of intervention to really move the dial for these patients. I can share that in, in spite of that wonderful table, which is so informative and, and, and great, I'm going to have to leave adenomyosis out of my treatment program. I'm not going to treat patients in my pseudo clinic or advise them on adenomyosis. But seriously, I mean, after reading this, I'm not kidding. You know, the scope of this seems so wide. Started with 500 articles on the generic search terms, got it down 123. I mean, that's like everything that's out there pretty much on adenomyosis. And it reads like it too between the anatomical endometrial epithelium or stromal, the serum osteopontin and E-selectin, the KRAS part there, the immune inflammatory component. Looking at this, I was kind of overwhelmed with how, how little we know, as you're alluding to there, Pietro. So I ask you guys, what when you read this kind of paper, are you just like, wow, uh, it's so much that we don't know. And you're, you're intimidated and, and realize how deep in the woods we are in adenomyosis and how little we have to help our patients? Or does this inform your patient counseling or clinical decisions? Well, I feel like the focus ultimately is it, it becomes kind of narrow, right? I mean, the authors did the very heavy lifting for us and ultimately taking 500 plus articles down to 100 plus articles and and then having this very short statement at the end that, hey, maybe doing some GNRH agonist uh, suppression before frozen embryo transfer may be the only thing that would help. Um, so although, yes, I, I agree, still vague and there's just so much uncertainty with these patients, but uh, at least it's summarized into a, a small recommendation overall uh, that's that's pretty clear. But otherwise, you know, what else do you do with these patients? I, I will admit I feel helpless at times with these patients. And uh, and although I've taken patients to the OR and proceeded with the same approach that you had mentioned, Pietro, uh, despite a lot of blood loss in the patient, um, to my surprise, was very pleased afterwards and said her pain and bleeding was a lot better. I was like, great. You know, it's, it's one of those things where you just kind of feel helpless with, with these patients. So aside from doing the recommendations in this paper, I don't have a whole lot more to add to it. So there's a paper in FNS that talks about this. Is adenomyosis and deep infiltrating endo the same disease, just presenting in slightly different ways? They're both invasive. 
we both know that there's a component of abnormal glandular tissue that's in spots where it shouldn't be that's cycling and has inappropriate expression of hormone receptors on it. But is it the same disease? And if so, can we use similar lines of therapies in a similar way to kind of tackle both? With endometriosis, we typically talk about excision because it's just much more amenable to excision. But should we be more aggressive about excising adenomyomas? Should we be more aggressive about radiofrequency ablation of areas of adenomyosis to turn off kind of its synthetic function and reduce some of its badness that it's secreting into the, to the lining, to the, to the receptivity? I think we just kind of have an off and on switch right now with Lupron, and that feels like so not fun and so not refined. But read that article. It's by Andrea Vidali, association with an article by Sirdar Bulin from Northwestern um, that really kind of challenged the idea that this is probably one disease on different ends of the spectrum. Um, I think it's a pretty interesting concept and maybe a hypothesis generating for what to do next. Yeah, very interesting points for sure. Well, guys, that's all the time we have for today. We've covered a lot of ground. We started about how to extract sperm from a testicle out to 106 hours. We talked about keeping mice awake for six hours with gentle handling, and then ended up with, I think, more questions than answers with regard to adenomyosis and how to best manage it. There's a lot of good science coming out in FNS reports, reviews, and science. These are just kind of our favorites from each month. Check it out online. You know that these are not print journals. You're receiving the table of contents in your email if you're signed up for those. Um, but all of these are accessible through your ASRM and Fertility and Sterility membership online. Until we meet again, thanks so much for listening. Dalon Blake, see you next time. This concludes our episode of Fertility and Sterility on Air, brought to you by Fertility and Sterility in conjunction with the American Society for Reproductive Medicine. This episode was produced by Dr. Michael Simone and Dr. Molly Cornfield. This podcast was developed by Fertility and Sterility and the American Society for Reproductive Medicine as an educational resource and service to its members and other practicing clinicians. While the podcast reflects the views of the authors and the hosts, it is not intended to be the only approved standard of practice or to direct an exclusive course of treatment. The opinions expressed are those of the discussants and do not reflect fertility and sterility or the American Society for Reproductive Medicine.